How many of you learned something these past weeks? Six weeks, seven weeks? How many have been on this? Uh, several weeks, praise God. And uh, I, I like how Pastor has built all of the different furnishings. We step in 50 cubits by 100 cubits long through the outer court gate, which speaks of identification. Everybody say identify. How many of you are identified with Christ? When he's asking you to put a sticker on your car, it means that you're willing to be visible about this thing. And the tabernacle's right out there in the face of anybody. It's central to all of the tribes of Israel. You can't miss it. And the church isn't a side issue. The church isn't peripheral. The church is central. I mean, you know, Jesus is supposed to be the center of everything in our life, and the church is the center of everything in the community. Hallelujah. Because the center of the world is Israel. The center of Israel is Jerusalem. The center of Jerusalem is the Temple Mount. The center of the Temple Mount is the temple. The center of the temple is the Holy of Holies. The center of the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Covenant. So in other words, God's the center of everything. Come on, saints. So we have identification. We come to the brazen altar, and that's justification. How many of you have been justified by the blood of Jesus? We come to the laver filled with water, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. That's sanctification. So identification, justification, sanctification. Move into the inner court. We meet the table which speaks of edification. Aren't you glad for the Word of God that edifies you? And this candle that's filled with oil, symbolic of the burning passion of God's Spirit. That's illumination. And then into the uh, golden altar intercession. Then we move through the veil into the Holy of Holies this morning and we will see perfection. Seven things that we're talking about from outer court to whole inner court to Holy of Holies to reach a life that it stands before God wholly perfect. How many of you want to be perfect? You say, well, you can't be perfect in this life. Well, a pastor was preaching on perfection one time, said, is anybody in this house perfect? And a gentleman on the back row jumped up and shocked the pastor. He said, what do you mean you're perfect? He said, I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm standing in for my wife's first husband. Amen. So there, there are some people that think they're perfect. But even though we're not perfect, he said, let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. And this we will do if the Lord permit. How do you know he wants to permit us to go on unto perfection? Matthew 5, 48, Jesus said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Seven is the perfect number of God, right? And so we're going through all of these different uh, uh, sessions and these different phases to get to a place in God where we reach the perfection of the Lord. Amen. There's an outer court. Say outer court. Inner court. Holy of holies. The tabernacle is as easy as one, two, three. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. In him we live and move and have our being. Now abide faith and hope. Love these three. Praise God. You go all the way through the Bible. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, uh, uh, your body, your soul, your spirit, outer court, inner court, holy of holies. Everything in God is a three concept provision that leads us into this perfection. In the outer court, notice the sun up there. Do you see the sun shining? So people in the outer court walk by natural light, by sunshine light. That's why the world doesn't understand the things that are inside these hidden coves. Because it operates by simple, simple logic. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them because they're foolishness. Huh? Have you know, uh, waving, uh, waving these banners and laying flat on your face with smoke filling up the auditorium is foolishness to the world. But to people that have stepped inside the courts and have entered his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, it's not, it, 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 it's not foolishness. In here you get your understanding by the light of the oil. That's anointed light. So there's people that are logical minded. There are people that are anointed minded. They've learned to lean and find their direction by God the Holy Spirit's guidance. How many of you have moved out of just natural thinking and now you let the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the fire of God's word direct your path? How many of you do that? Amen? But there's another step. 
as there's natural light and there's anointed light, when you get into here, it's the glory effulgence, the glory light of God. And what he wants us to move to is not just thinking with logic or thinking with just the anointing, but moving into what? Face-to-face revelation and communion and fellowship with God himself. Is that possible? Well, you got to go through the steps. Huh? So this morning, last week, I assume Pastor talked about uh, uh, the, the inner court is 10 cubits by 10 cubits, 20 cu- cubits deep. And 10 times 10 is 100 times 20 is 2,000. And we believe that we're at the end of the 2,000 cubit uh, partition. 2,000 years since Calvary. Amen. This first veil symbolizes the birth of Jesus. Mark off 2,000 cubits. Mark off 2,000 years. And now we're coming to what? The second advent of Jesus. When that day comes, John said, I saw heaven open. The veil's about to swing open. And he said, there he is, which leads us into this final phase of God's economy. 10 by 10 by 10. Pastor just mentioned it. 10 times 10 is 100. Notice that gate is 5 by 20. 5 times 20 is... A hundred. So when you come into Christ, you need to come in how much? hundred percent. When you step into the inner court of grace, did you notice that everything out here is bronze looking? Copper? Because that speaks about judgment on sin. But when you step into this court, notice gold, 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 gold. There's no copper in the inner court which means that under the old covenant of the law, it is judgment on sin. But when you step into the grace of God, watch this, there is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Are you with me on this? So are you glad this morning that you're not living under brass of judgment and condemnation, but you're experiencing the gold of the wealth and the gold of the glory and the gold of the uh, unbelievable promises of God for this 2,000-year period of time, the entire church age. But the veil's about to open, and we're about to enter into this last move of God. 1,000 years. The sin and sorrow, pain and death of this dark world shall cease in a glorious reign with Jesus of a thousand years apiece. Oh, my soul is groaning, crying for that day of sweet release when our blessed Christ comes back to earth again. How many know one day is with the Lord as what? A thousand years. A thousand years as what? One day. So a thousand cubit room would symbolize a thousand year reign. How many of you are looking forward to the millennium? Mela, thousand But here's the good news, and and we're going to get in there in just a second. But here's the good news. 2,000 years ago, the veil ripped. So we're not waiting for the millennium. The veil is open to it right now. You don't have to live in the millennium to live millennially. The millennium is the kingdom of God on earth. But Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. So let's don't put off, folks, this last experience for some sweet day by and by. But realize right now because Jesus shed his blood on the cross that God took the veil and ripped it from the top to the bottom and swung it open like shower curtains and says, whosoever will, let him come and take of this water of life. We can experience the glory right now. Amen? Let's read that in Hebrews chapter 9 if you've got a Bible. And I need a couple of brothers to help me move some furniture so that we can see it better. Uh, I need a couple of guys, just kind of 45. Just kind of put that as a 45 on that mercy seat so people can see it a little better. And then, just, and when you do that, guys, just stay here because I want to show you something else. Hebrews chapter 9. Are you all there with me? Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand and table and showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Watch this, guys. Watch this with me. So in the first, there's what? The lampstand, the table, and the Are you with me today? There's a lampstand, a table, and 
showbread. That's what it says there. Now notice this, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden incense. Now, censer, now wait a minute. I thought the censer was in this compartment. And yet when we read Hebrews, now, everything that we see here was laid out from an Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 25 and 26 standpoint. But when you get into Hebrews, in this inner sanctuary, the lampstand, the table, the bread, but he says nothing about this golden incense altar. But look at verse Look at verse 4, but, or verse 3. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tab- tablets of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we cannot now speak in detail, but I'm going to speak as much detail as there is. Come here, guys. It said that this censer is not in the sanctuary. Pull it, pick it up. It says it is in the Holy of Holies. Go around if you have to. They don't have room there. They don't have room. It's in the Holy of Holies. Do you all see what I put it right here, right here, right here, right here? Thank you. Now you can be seated. You say, what in the world is Jackson teaching us today? Very clearly what's in the Scripture. That under the Old Covenant, these items were in the sanctuary, but when we move to the book of Hebrews, after the resurrection, the censer is now moved into the Holy of Holies, which tells us that Jesus, amen, is no longer in this earthly sanctuary, but now he stands right before the throne of God and ever liveth to make intercession for us. And you better rejoice today that because of Christ's death and resurrection, the veil has been opened up, and you worshipers, you prayers, you intercessors, now have right to come right boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We sang this morning that if any two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, they shall ask and it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And today the church has been transported no longer, folks, on an earthly plane, but seated where? In heavenly places in Christ. How many of you are in the millennium right now, so to speak? I hope they understood that. That, that confused anybody? All right, guys, move that back so I can focus in on this, uh, on the, on the uh, Ark of the Covenant now. Everybody say, park the ark. Say, park the ark right here. I also like to call this the kabod abode. The word for, uh, in Hebrew for glory is kabod. It means weightiness in its first use, or it means the heavy weight of God. So when we step into the holy of holies, the glory is there. One of these days, the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Huh? He said, as I live, saith the Lord, all flesh shall see my glory. God's intention from the very beginning was to be able to tabernacle amongst men. For his glory to be able, see, there's something that is separated us. That something here is called the veil, the holy veil. Or in Hebrew, the, uh, the parakath. It means a separation. Our sins have separated between us and God. Folks, amen. We, we can do all of the stuff in here. We, we can, we can uh, the water, we can, we can uh, preach sermons, the, 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 the oil, we can have the gifts of the Spirit, the bread, we can have communion, the golden altar with incense, we can pray to God. But this spirituality that I want to talk about is more than sermons and prayers and gifts. What we want is face-to-face communion with God. Somewhere in Bakersfield, California, there's going to be a face place. Huh? Not only park the ark, the kabod abode, there's going to be a face place. A place when you walk into the door, you realize you're not just in a common sanctuary, but you're in the holy of holies. We sang about it this morning, we sing about it a lot, but is there such a reality for mankind? He said the veil has to be ripped, right? 2,000 years ago, the veil was ripped. When we take a piece of 
wafer on a communion Sunday and break it, that's a symbol of the veil being ripped. When Jesus' body on the cross was wounded and pierced, that's a picture of the veil being ripped. So to get into the Holy of Holies, a veil must be rent. Your flesh must be rent. Your old way of thinking must be rent. Your negative attitudes must be rent. There is never access into the courts of God unless something tears. The other night up in Porterville where they heard me, I preached on let her rip. And how do you know we need to take the veil from the top to the bottom, from God's glory down to earth where we're praying, and tear it in two. Somebody shout let her rip. God wants his family close to him. Huh? Tommy Tenney said it like this. Imagine sometimes when I go to the hotel at a meeting and I take my kids with me. We can't all fit in one room. So my wife and I will be in this room and we'll have the adjoining room for the children. But even though there's only a two-by-four stud wall between us and them, even though they're very close, it's nothing like having them in the same room with me. And what happened, folks? God has always wanted to be in the same room with his kids. It's been impossible because of sin. It's been because, impossible because of the broken law. But in Jesus Christ, who is the veil, in Jesus, who is the one that was torn and crucified and ripped for our transgressions, he said, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated through his flesh, that is to say, his body. He said, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know if I'm losing everybody. I, I think I can connect with you here. So we're moving from, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. Have you done that? I will enter his courts with praise. Have you done that? But notice, folks, under the law, only one could enter into the Holy of Holies. Who was he? The high priest. Only once a year, and that not without blood, which he would shed for his own sins and the sins of the people. But under this new covenant, we enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, but we enter the holy of holies with worship. I don't know if you understand the difference in these terms. Outer court, we're thanking him for what he's done. Inner court, we're praising him for what he's doing. But holy of holies, we worship him because of who he is. Outer court is appreciation. Inner court is admiration. But holy of holies is adoration. And God wants to tear down the wall that separates between us and him and let us come and adore him, Christ the Lord. Praise God. Notice, in this last move, this last thousand years, how much furniture is there? One piece. Which means that Christ will be all and in all. Huh? He's at the center of a 10 by 10 by 10 room, which means all around Jesus is glory, 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 glory. Everywhere you look, glory. He will be central. United Nations won't be central in the thousand years. Huh? Obama, care? I got a book called Jehovah Care. Forget Obamacare. Try Jehovah Care. Come on, saints. Obama won't be central, Putin won't be central, ISIS won't be central, even Netanyahu, as much as I love him, won't be central. There is a day coming, folks, uh, when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God, and he shall be Lord for a thousand years on this earth. Hallelujah. This ark, park the ark right here, Lord. The ark is made of acacia wood. It's covered with gold. There's an interesting thing I want you to see about this, is that the brazen altar is brass, right? Copper. The laver is copper. The lampstand is made of gold. The table and the altar are acacia wood covered with gold. But the Ark of the Covenant is gold inside of gold. It says gold within and without. Now what does that mean? That means we're moving from glory to glory. From brass to Gold, from gold to gold inside of gold. Did you follow me? My, is this getting too much? Outer court is what? Natural light. Inner court is what? Anointed light. Holy of holies is what? Divine light. Come on, saints. Outer court is thanksgiving. Inner court is what? Praise. 
Holy of Holies then is worship. Outer court is justification. Inner court is sanctification. Holy of Holies is glorification. I want to move into that glory, but watch this. Brass and then gold and then gold inside of gold. You can't see what's inside that box this morning. But inside it, folks, is just what's on the outside of it. It's gold on the inside, gold on the outside. Somebody might say, wow, Jackson, now he's pure gold. They have no clue what Jackson is. Huh? Why? Because you, you can see the outside. Yeah, I might be gold, but you don't know the interior. But the plan of God in perfection is to make us some, to where we are the same on the inside as we are on the outside. This article of furniture is made of acacia wood or shittim. Shittim wood is not like oak or mahogany or something that we would use to make fine furnishing. It is a twisted, gnarled, knotted, hard to work with wood. Amen. How do you know, folks, when we move into perfection, we're still us. We come from a twisted background, a hard to work with background. Come on, saints. How many of you had so many thorns on your life before you became a Christian that you couldn't have sit on the same pew with another Christian if you'd have tried to? Huh? We believers need each other than we needle each other. (laughs) But God's man, Basileel, trims off all the thorns. What's our teaching doing? It's trimming off the thorns. Huh? He has to split the acacia wood open. How many of you know that the Holy Ghost is splitting us to where our hearts can be exposed so that we can deal with our carnal, twisted, knotted, hard to work with, thorny natures? Anybody, does that describe you? Huh? We have any twisted folks in this building? You picture me when I had hair halfway down my back playing rock and roll guitar, doing everything that went with it back in the hippie days. And I'll tell you what, folks, I was twisted. And when I got married, my wife thought, you're hard to work with. But then he does what? He lays it out on a plank and he molds it together. Then he overlays it with molten gold so that when the priest looks down, he does not see the acacia wood. He sees the reflection of himself. And the great news this morning, no matter how bad you were or how twisted your normal nature was, you have now been overlaid, literally, quote, overcome. The Spirit of the Lord has overcome your flesh nature. And now Christ sees the reflect image of himself, but not only on the outside, praise God, it can happen on the inside. He desires truth in the inward man. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is what? Within me. How many of you got a within this morning? Beautiful thing about this ark, different than any of the other furniture, is that it has a within. Glory. Is there anybody in there? Pastor, if I had a, quote, neighbor that supposedly lived next to me, but I never seen him go out, I never saw the garage door open, I never saw anybody go out on the deck and cook burgers. I never saw the blinds go up or down. I got somebody living next door to me. I never see him go out to get the newspaper. I never hear any sound coming from the television set. I never see no twinkling lights at night evidencing uh, getting up to run to the restroom. You know what I'd start to wonder? Is there anybody in there? Why don't you turn to your neighbor? Let's talk about the inside. Say, is there anybody in there? This is the abode of God. He wants to set on a sanctified heart, but there are things inside this ark. Three things. Golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and these two tablets of stone that are pictured here. Huh? So there's something on the inside. If we took away the manna, if we took away the staff, if we took away the commandments, what would you have? Emptiness. Come on, saints. It's not enough for you just to present your body. It's not enough for you just to go to church. It's not enough for you just to position yourself in the right court. You need to be filled. Huh? You are a carrier of something. What is the, uh, the pot of manna? Well, it's symbolic of the living bread. It symbolizes God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the bread of life, but as he feeds us this ongoing supply, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. Huh? The, 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 the Aaron's rod that budded with just an old dried up stick. They were 
fussing with Moses about who the, Levi, or who the priesthood, what family line, what tribe should have the priesthood. And God said, everybody bring up your staffs for all the leaders of Israel. Put them in the tabernacle, and tomorrow morning I'll show you who is the chosen tribe. And the next morning, what happened? Aaron's rod had sprouted a branch, had budded and produced almonds. Come on, saints. That's a type of what? If the, if the manna is a picture of the Holy Spirit, then this rod that budded is a picture of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Come on, saints. Who rose again and today has brought forth the almond blossoms and almond berries. And the almond was the first tree in Israel to bloom in the spring. Jesus is the first resurrection, the first begotten, the first fruit of the resurrection. And here's the neat thing about it. I have the bread inside me. The manna is within. The living, resurrected Christ is where? He's within. And then the law of God, symbolic of God the Father. I have the Spirit. I have the Son. I have the Father. And so do you. Living where? He shall be with you, but he shall be in you. We don't just have a God with us. Thank God for God with us. Bethlehem was God with us. But Calvary was God for us. But Pentecost is God in us. Turn to your neighbor and say, anybody in there? How many of you have him within? How could you have him within and not know it? Come on, saints. You remember when they took the they took the rod and, and uh, they carried it in their hand. To, when, when this rod was placed into this box, Aaron let go of what was in his hand. I'm asking you this morning as we look at this sinless perfection that God's taking us to, that you let go of what's in your hand. Huh? The pot of manna was where? They brought it and put it in their home. I'm asking you not only to let go of everything that's in your hand, I'm asking you to let go of everything that's in your home. Well, this is a big order, isn't it? These two uh, stone commandments, the new covenant, God says, I'll write them in your heart. I'm asking you not only to let go of everything in your hand and everything in your home, but to place in the box, in dedication, everything in your heart. Say, that's asking a lot. Well, if you give him everything in your hand, he'll give you everything in his hand. If you give him everything in your home, he'll give you everything in his home. If you give him everything in your heart, he will give you everything in his heart. Come on, saints. The only way to receive the abundance, the perfection, the fullness of God's spirit and God's glory in your life is to lay it down. And then what? They take the mercy seat, set it upon the box. The blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat, and God takes his throne, his position where? Seated on the throne of the human heart. Everybody say, you can park the ark here. Park the ark here. Praise God. Let's talk about these stones for just a minute. Notice when you go to the uh, Christian bookstore, they'll give you a sheet of paper, and it has ten commandments. But it's not ten commandments. It is two Tablets of stone with five commandments each, right? God doesn't just list ten. Why? Because they're separate commandments. They are made of etched stone. I mean, stone doesn't care much about whether it hurts your toe or not. The law of God is not feeling-based. The law of God doesn't care what you think. It'll crush you just as soon as bless you. But with the finger of God etched on the law of God, five commandments that have to do between your relationship with you and God. Right? You shall have no other gods before me. Huh? You shall not make any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God, etc. But then the next five not only deal with your relationship with God, they deal with your relationship with people. Because thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou, etc. Five of them are vertical, five are horizontal, five are theological, five are sociological. Do you understand today that to be a Christian is not only a theology thing between you and God, it becomes a sociology thing between you and your fellow man. 
How can you say that you love God whom you've not seen if you don't love your brother whom you have seen? And he said, this is the first commandment, love the Lord with all your heart and soul and strength and mind. That's vertical, but then what? And your brother as yourself, that's horizontal. The word ark in, in Hebrew is, is, aron, is uh, aron. And uh, aron is translated, how long do we have, Pastor? I, uh, what am I supposed to close? Take what I need. <laughs> oh, this is, a, this is a, a long subject. We'll stop in due season. But listen, folks, the Hebrew word is aron. Everybody say aron with a hon. It means, it can mean box, it can mean but, but the basic meaning behind it, notice this, is the Holy of Holies the richest of this teaching? Is it the place that we're reaching for? Is it what we're striving to reach? How many of you are trying to get into that place in God? Well, then it's going to be shouting, it's going to be miracles, it's going to be glory, it's going to be hallelujah, it's going to, no, sorry. The Hebrew word aron is translated elsewhere as coffin. So, our trip for these seven weeks is to land us where? In a coffin. <laughs> 15 weeks, okay. We're going 15 weeks and we're ending up in a coffin. Well, that's God's plan is to bring us to complete death to this old nature where everything in our hand, everything in our home, everything in our heart has been surrendered to Christ. Could you sing it with me? I surrender 10%. I surrender ten, six, six and a half percent. Is that what the song says? All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. And it's not Christian perfection until we've laid this old acacia wood, this twisted, bent, defiled nature down and allowed the work of God to bring the fullness of in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we can have the manna. We can have the rod. We can have the commandments. Unbroken commandments. Come on, folks. Do you remember when inside your heart uh, were broken commandments? Do you remember when everything inside you was a conviction of, a, of defeat and failure because you had blown it? Uh, but look what Christ has done for us. This is all a picture of Christ. Uh, we're identified in him. He has the resurrection. He is the living manna. He fulfilled perfectly the laws of the commandment of God. And our responsibility now is just to come boldly to the throne and receive it hallelujah this ark is interesting because it is a cubit and a half high if you follow that over this is two cubits high this is a cubit and a half high if you come out into the outer court the grate here where you guys burnt your uh, old sins is what a cubit and a half you say I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm getting everything here Cube and a half, cube and a half, cube and a half. Huh? Now, it's a fractional number because we only understand a fraction of this. But a cube and a half is half of three. You're a body, you're a soul, you're a spirit. You need to be what? The veil needs to be rent. So God's standard is a cubit and a half, a cubit and a half, a cubit and a half. He is the same yesterday today, and forever. Did you notice God's standards didn't change? People says, well, God was one way in the whole Old Testament. He's another way now, and he'll be a different way when we get in the millennium. But he said, I am the Lord, I change not. And even though his standards may look different the way we preach some of the things, but he didn't change one single bit, folks. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. And if you could bank on him out there and what he did for you on the cross, if you can bank on him what he's doing for you with the oil of the Holy Spirit in this present text, then you can trust that our best days are ahead. Come on, folks. And if we'll fulfill the standard of God, the glory of God will come upon us. Lord, make this the face place. Park the ark at New Beginnings. Praise God. I like my new title, Park the Ark Here. Yeah. Hallelujah. But notice this. Now, we've got to wrap this up. There is a mercy seat, which is a, actually the seventh piece of furniture. It is sat on top of the box because if the box is not covered, then the law 
is not covered. You and I have broken the law. Why did judgment fall on Adam? Broken law. When the ark was taken from Beth Shemesh, or taken to Beth Shemesh after being with the Philistines, remember when it was the Philistines, they opened the top of it, and God struck them with, uh, uh, with uh, emeralds, is what it said in King James. Emeralds, you translate that, hemorrhoids. You know, you don't want to mess with God. You might get emeralds, need some preparation. E, emeralds. God nipped them where it felt the worst. But that was the Philistines. When the ark was parked at Beth Shemesh, they thought, we better open up, check, and make sure everything's in here and that the Philistines didn't mess with God. And they opened it up, and guess what? 50,000 people were struck, and 70 of them, it appears, uh, died on the spot. Why? Why did the Philistines not die? They got struck with hemorrhoids. But the Israelites died because the Philistines had no knowledge of sin. But the Israelites knew not to open the lid. Come on, saints. And uh, because of our sin, there must be propitiation. In fact, the word mercy seat means propitiation. So at the brazen altar, a lamb died for our sins, right? Here Jesus died for us. But they brought the blood of the bullock and the blood of the, blood of the scapegoat in, and they sprinkled it before the Ark of the Covenant. So notice this, folks. Uh, out there is past. He died for us. But in here is present and future, and he makes intercession for us. And the great news, folks, that what Jesus did on the cross uh, is not just a historical uh, entry in the encyclopedia. Amen. He rose again, and today that censer is right in front of the Ark of the Covenant, and our high priest Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for us and that blood that's on there is not a dried up coagulated scabby blood it is the living blood of the everlasting covenant and it can be trusted he's the same yesterday today and forever the high priest came in I don't have time to give the whole picture of Yom Kippur or, or the day of covering or atonement but he sprinkled the blood seven times notice this we talk about the blood on the mercy seat, but it first says he sprinkled it before the mercy seat, which would mean what? There is a pathway of blood as it has been sprinkled that leads to the mercy seat. And Jesus has made the passage. He's made our walkway in his own blood that leads us to a propitiated mercy seat. Out here, it's a judgment seat. Somebody had to die. In here, it's a mercy seat. Somebody gets to live. Did you hear me? Out there was a judgment seat. Jesus, the Lamb, had to die for us. But in here, it's a mercy seat. For Jesus, the Lamb, lives for us. When we get to heaven, we'll see with our eyes as he steps forth from behind the throne and walks right in front of it, just as that censer is in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And all hands will raise and all knees will bow and all crowns will drop as we say worthy is the lamb who has redeemed us by thy blood out of every nation and kindred and people and tongue and has made us kings and priests to our God. I know I need to close. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Everything's in sevens, right? What happened to Jesus on the cross? Our high priest sprinkled seven times. Blood came from his pores as he prayed in Gethsemane. Blood came from his face as they jerked the beard out of the sinless face of the lamb. Blood came from his scalp as they drove the, cat, the crown of thorns into his head. And from his back as the cat of nine tails tore flesh for our healing. And from his hands as he was spiked. And from his feet as he was nailed to the cross. And from his side as a madman drove a lance under the ribcage of Jesus. And blood and water poured out. Seven bleedings. Hallelujah. And he sprinkled seven times. Notice the mercy seat, folks. I know I've got to close, but give me just five more minutes. Who will give me five? Who will give, give me five? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. I think it's 40. Can I say something about the mercy seat? 
Now, it, it, well, I, well, I'm not cutting it short. We're going. The, there were no horns, uh, but there's a crown. Why? The crown symbolizes the king. We are ultimately moving to what? The kingdom of God. And Christ the king will live. This mercy seat is the same dimensions as the Ark of the Covenant. Why would that be important? Because the grace of God perfectly meets human need. You, you, it's not bigger, we don't need bigger. But it's not smaller, we don't need less. Christ did what? He perfectly fulfilled the demands of the law of God. And he perfectly provides for the full parameter of our need. Are you glad for that? But the mercy seat has no acacia wood in it. Why? Because it was not, be, because salvation is of God and God alone. Don't you put Catholic uh, acacia wood in the middle of my salvation. Don't you add no Mormon acacia wood or assembly of God acacia wood. Huh? This salvation is all of God. The lid comes down from above. Salvation is from heaven. It comes down to man. It is without acacia wood, which means it is without flaw. He is the perfect demand for a perfect law. And when that's set down on that ark, how do you know? The law of God beneath is what? Covered. Everybody say, you got it covered, Lord. How many of you got financial coverage? You have insurance coverage? You're, how many of you are covered? Well, there's no coverage, folks, like coming to the cross, trusting the blood, and being able to say, just as there was a covering on the ark of Noah, just like there was a covering on the, brazen, uh, on the, uh, on the ark of the covenant, that today my sin is covered. But not just covered, it's gone. Under the Old Testament, uh, Kofar spoke of, of uh, just covering under the New Testament. Hilasterion speaks of the absolute removal of our sins. Praise God. Notice that there are two cherubim angels. And if you'll notice there that the angels have their backs turned to each other and their noses are up in the air. Do you see that? Huh? Well, well, well that's the type of the inner holy of holies. See, where we're at right now in the outer court, or in the inner court, there's still some folks got their backs turned to each other with a nose up in the air. That's not the way it was. If any two, how many? If any two shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, their wings touch tip to tip. Why is that? Put your finger out, Sister Ruth. Because where your influence ends, mine begins. And where my ends, yours begins. And how do you know, folks, that the angels of God are facing in the same direction? Because this speaks of agreement towards the blood of Christ. Uh, amen. Their eyes are not looking at each other. Notice this. I don't look at you to see if I compare with you, nor should you ever look at me to see if you compare with me. But with our fingers, our wings together, they point where? At the blood. The one thing that ties us together, folks, is not how big our ministry is or who we are and God's who's who. It's whether we look to the blood and the thing that brings his Hispanic and white and black and rich and poor and young and old and Jew and Gentile. This side to that side is what? The blood. It's not the name on your door that counts. It's the blood on the door. God parked the ark here today. These angels are made of the same gold that the mercy seat's made of. Aren't you glad today, folks, that we are not add-ons that have just been welded on to God. But our new nature is of the same element, of the same DNA. If any man, he that has the Spirit of God is one spirit with the Lord. And this is a beautiful picture of worship coming together in perfect unity to make a seat for the Holy of Holies. Pastor flies an airplane. To fly an airplane you have to have what? A landing strip. Everybody say, this is your landing strip, park the ark. I said, this is your landing strip, park the ark. And where does he land? We sang it today. For wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I where? In their midst. And just as cloven tongues of fire sat upon each of them, just as Jesus sat on a white colt of a foal of an ass, now just as he went and sat at the right hand of God. 
He said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him and will what? Sup with him. He that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I am also sat with my Father in his throne. Listen, we don't need to sit right now. We got work to do. But there's a day coming when this job is over and a thousand year reign comes, and then it's time to what? Sit with your Father in the kingdom and sit on 12 thrones in the glory of the resurrection. The perfection doesn't come until he's seated on the heart. Everybody say, park the ark here, Lord. Let me give you a last point. I, I, there's other things I can close. But uh, it's uh, one side, two side, three side, four side, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Five side, six side, six the number of sinful man. Two and a half cubits wide. Two and a half cubits long, rather. Two and a half, two and a half, five, five grace. We could spend all day just talking about that. But I want you to notice this before we close. The staffs or the staves are connected to the ark by rings. Can you all handle three more minutes? Sure you can. If you watch Raiders of the Lost Ark, or if you were there when the guys were being stricken with hemorrhoids, you'd know I don't want to touch that ark. I used to teach this, like to carry the ark in my back seat with me on my Lincoln town car. That way, if I ever got pulled over by the police, I'd say, watch it, buddy. Amen. (laughs) But you don't want to mess with the ark, right? But notice this. Man picks up these staffs, hoists it on their shoulders. I, if I be lifted up from the earth, The Ark of the Covenant isn't needed behind curtains today. The Ark of the Covenant's needed, as our brother said, hallelujah, out where people can see it. And this thing was transported, and we're in the blood transport business. And the world needs a church that will lift up Jesus, lift up the seven sprinkled blood, lift up the glory of God. And notice this, those staffs, You don't touch the ark, but you can touch the staff. Why is that? There's a human side to worship. I mean, we can come up. I saw a girl up here do uh, cartwheels during worship. Back in my religious days, I'd say, uh, sorry, we don't do cartwheels in church. Huh? But there's there's a human side to this thing where you can do just about anything, and it's all right. Why? As long as you're doing it as unto the Lord. You can grab hold of the staff. It's all right. But don't you go grabbing the glory. But there's something that unites the staff with the ark, and it's what? Four gold rings. What is a ring? You know what a ring is, folks. I got one on my finger here. It's circular. It has no beginning. It has no ending. It's a picture of the eternality of God. It's made of gold. I didn't get uh, one made out of lead or pewter. Why? Because this is a covenant between my wife and I. Huh? And it's pure gold, or maybe mine isn't, I don't know, but it costs like it was. And it's a symbol of what? When I placed that on her finger and she placed it on mine, we came into a covenant. We're able now, officially, to come together. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit who is the the, uh, earnest of the inheritance. Some translations say the wedding ring. The engagement ring. We are the Holy Spirit is who brings us to God. We have access to the Father, access to the Son, access to the glory realm. And we have it when we come into covenant with Christ. How many of you got the ring on your finger? You have the ring on your heart. You belong to Him. You're sworn to Christ. Not adulterous with the world, but I'm His. And he said, the stave shall not be taken from the reins. It doesn't mean that somebody in their own volition couldn't just backslide and pull the staff out. But it means the grace of God is always there to keep us united through this bond of love and covenant through the Holy Spirit to be one with God. Hallelujah. When this pattern, as I close, is finished, in Exodus chapter forty. Listen, folks, the last chapter of Exodus. 
after everything was set in place, everybody turn here with me as we close. Let's read one verse of Scripture at least. Since we... 40, and 40 and 34? Read that, Pastor. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Read the verse before that. The verse before that. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate so Moses finished the work. Okay, here's what I want you to see. Moses finished the work. We're at the finish of this series of meetings. And 2,000 years ago when Jesus cried from the cross, Te telestai, it is finished. This is a picture from the Old Testament of the finished work. Everything's in place. The ark, the bread, the table, the showbread, the oil, the gold, the, everything's in place. And then what happens? Moses walks out of the finished Holy of Holies, stands at the gateway, and says to everybody, it is finished. And when he did, what happened? The cloud, the glory, the kabod. God sent his presence down in a mighty glorious fashion and I'll tell you I don't it doesn't say what happened but you read other passages in the Bible and you know that the priests are falling like bowling pins and people are getting healed and the power of God has come down and there's a shout of praise and there is victory in the camp why because it's finished I want you to lift your hands right now with me say God finish the work you've started in Bakersfield park the ark right here Send us your glory. Stand on your feet, both hands in the air. I want you to begin to vocalize and audibleize your praise. Everybody out of your heart, come on. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, into the holy of holies with worship. I say praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him.